Father, thank You this evening for the wonderful Gospel, for Jesus, for Your great love for us, for the full demonstration of that, for the Word of God, for the church. God, for a plan that though Your final work on earth is not finished, a plan that leaves sin and redemption fully taken care of, and salvation fully executed. I just pray that you would thrill our hearts with this and help us as we look at nuggets for church discipline this evening. And I pray that you would bless it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for standing. You may be seated. And we will turn to 460. 460. Leaning on the everlasting <clears throat> arms. <clears throat> 460. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from
Good evening. Uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, scripture distribution at 6 p.m. Yeah. So thanks so much for the folks that came. And I, I know that this last week we got at least 1,500 of those. So I don't know uh, exactly how Brother Tony's going to schedule the entire uh, releasing of them or getting them out. But I do know this, we had a fantastic week last week. And whenever things go great, a lot of times people say, well, you know, things are going really good. And then we slack off a little bit. Let's have another good week. Let's see if we can get out a bunch tomorrow and Tuesday. Amen. If you're able to clear your schedule and to be there, just commit to that. We'll use you. It'll, it'll help with the effort. You can't uh, imagine how much of a help it is for me to be able to have everyone in the church participate. And what an encouragement just to, to our entire ministry it is for everybody to be involved as they should be. We're going to have Brother Andrew come and we'll take up tonight's offering and we'll move right along with our announcements or with our service. Father, thank you this evening for the privilege of giving. Thank you this evening that you've supplied our needs so abundantly. Lord, your blessing has, has just always been so abundant that it almost seems second nature to expect it. Help us this evening uh, to be fresh about our giving and thoughtful and obedient. And Lord, I pray that you would supply the needs of this ministry. And so as a result, we ask that Christ would be lifted up and glorified and that souls would be saved and the work would be accomplished. We pray in Jesus' name.
Blessed be the name of Jesus. I'm so glad he took me in. He's forgiven my transgressions. He has cleansed my heart from sin. I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away. First and Second Thessalonians. All of it. <laughs> what saves what saves a person from sin and condemnation? Jesus does. Jesus is the person who saves us. God saves us because of the work of Christ on the cross. What causes us to receive God's propitiation? Okay, propitiation is a fancy 16-syllable word. What, humility? God doesn't save us because it requires humility to come to Jesus. Pride would, would prevent us. Humility would enable us to come to Jesus. Somebody said it a minute ago. Gospel. What? Yeah. What did you say? Gospel. Who said faith? Oh, is that Josiah? Figures. <laughs> yeah. yeah, faith. We're saved by faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the object of the faith. The work that He did on the cross is what saves us. If faith saves us, Anything that we look at in the life of a believer that we would argue is preventing us from being saved or causing us to be saved would not be so. Isn't it true? So many times, uh, and, and teenagers really seem to understand this many times better than adults do, so many times something that isn't the issue is phrased in a question of, how could a person be saved? And give me some how could a person be saved? And cut. Okay. How could a person be saved and swear? Well, let's just reverse the question. Has any better person been saved because they don't swear? Swearing or not swearing isn't salvific. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, should a Christian curse, swear? Does the Bible say anything specific about that? Yes, it does. A Christian shouldn't do that. Does that have anything to do with being saved? Or well, doesn't? Give me another one. How could a person be saved and commit suicide? I don't know how many people, uh, particularly if they have Catholic background in their culture, have come to me and said, Pastor, my friend took their life. And people are saying that they're in hell because you can't take your life and be saved. No. Now, let's reverse it. Does not committing suicide save you? Every person who hasn't committed suicide, are they saved? Nope. No. So is not committing suicide salvific? Is it a salvific matter? No. Oh. Is committing suicide, does it take away your salvation or mean you can't be saved? 
You're not saved by not committing suicide. You're not saved by you're not lost by committing suicide. That's not how you get lost. That's not how you get saved. Is suicide a sin? Yes. Does the Bible condemn it? Yes. Suicide's a sin. Is it a sin for a lost person to commit suicide? Is it a sin for a saved person to commit suicide? Yes, it is. Is it a sin for a lost person to curse or swear? Yes, it is. Is it a sin for a saved person to curse or swear? Yes, it is. Give me another one. Murder. Okay. And Mrs. Price is in hardcore sin right here. As far as probably <laughs> think about it. Uh, murder. Okay. How could a person be saved and take someone else's life? Pastor Price, do you know of any Christians who have committed a murder? Yes, I do. I'm personally acquainted with, I, off the top of my head, I can think of at least two people that I know that have taken somebody's life, committed murder, been tried for it and incarcerated for murder, and I believe they're saved. You don't think they're saved, do you? I see, I don't think they're saved. Right, because not murdering is how you get saved. Right? Is not committing murder, is that is that what saves somebody? Yeah. What about what the Scripture says? No murderer shall inherit the kingdom of God. Well, nobody is in heaven in their sin. No one comes into heaven with any of those things that the Scripture says. Uh, liars and adulterers, and let's see, adulterers and fornicators. What's Revelation 21 say? And all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which right. burn with fire and brimstone. You know, okay. Characterized by it. So do you get saved by... A lot of people use that one, don't they? Well, I've never... I've never killed somebody. ...murdered anyone. Therefore, I'm... Is not murdering how you get saved? No. Is murdering an evidence that you're not saved? No, murder isn't salvation. Give me another one. Lying. 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 I've never told a lie. <laughs> That's a lie. There's <laughs> one. Does not lying save you? Is that how you get saved? No. How do you get saved? Asking. Yeah, by asking God to save you. That's faith. Don't confuse sin and salvation. You don't get saved by not sinning. You're not unsaved by sinning. Sin is sin. Jesus died for sin. Without the commission of sin, Jesus' death is purposeless. Do we need to go into the discussion about whether or not Christians can sin? Very good. You know, but the same people that would say no are the same people that would say, well, I don't know how you commit that sin. Mm. Right? Oh, how you can have a filthy mouth like that and be saved. Right. Do you understand that you're not logical in the least bit? Do you understand that all you're saying is that you have sanctified sin and someone else has evil sin? Mm. Your sin's good, theirs is bad. That's all it is. Do you understand what a ridiculous hypocrite you are? Do you know how childish and foolish and silly that argument is? I'm telling you, if, if you could solve a ninth grade algebra problem, you could figure out the fallacy and the logic of that. And if you can't, don't tell anybody. It should be embarrassing to you. Go back to algebra class. Learn logic. I'd like to say I'm kidding about that, but I'm not. I'm serious. You know, if you're if you're an adult or even a thinking child, learn to deduce things logically. And if you if you can't make sense of that, you're not sensible. You're insensible. Okay, having said that, I'd like to talk about how to handle sin. How does a church handle sin? We have such ridiculous notions that that's the blanket statement we throw at sin, and I think that many times it is in order to excuse ourselves from handling it properly. It's easy to say, well, I just don't think they're saved, rather than trying to figure out how to fix the problem. 
You know that the church has a great deal of responsibility to deal with sin. And the responsibility isn't just to lay it on God. You're laying it on God when you say that a person who put faith in Christ didn't get saved because God evidently didn't do a good enough job for it to stick and work and have full effect. That's what you're saying. You say, Pastor, that's not what I'm saying. Well, you're illogical. You really, you just, you don't make good sense. And I would hate to deal with you in business or in any other kind of a life arrangement because you would be extremely unreasonable to deal with. Can I say it more tersely, more bluntly than that? I'm being as serious as I can. I'm trying to help you understand. We as believers need to understand how to deal with sin. And when you ever have a fill-in-the-blank statement, I don't know how they could be saved, and, and you say anything other than, and look to anything. If you said this, if you said, I don't know how you can be saved and not look to the cross. Is that, is that accurate? Could a person be saved without coming to the cross of Jesus Christ? Not on your death. No way, Jose. Right? That's logical, right? But if you say, I don't know how they could be saved, and fill in the blank with anything in the world else, and you have just made salvation something other than the cross. That's what you've done with your logic. And consequently, you have begun become completely unhelpful in trying to deal with the sin. You've gone off on something that has nothing to do with the problem, and you're trying to fix something else. <laughs> we all have a little bit of this in us because, just because of helplessness. <laughs> you ever go out to fix your car, maybe replace a part and vacuum, vacuum and wash it? Because you know how to vacuum and wash it, but you're not sure you won't mess something up if you replace the part? You ever in your house, you know, you go to fix something and you fix something else instead? <laughs> just because you're not, you just, there's a little lack of confidence that you even know how, like you never, you don't know if you'll succeed in fixing this thing. So, well, I can handle that and you tackle that instead. I think sometimes we just deal with the wrong thing because we really either don't have confidence in the, truth of the Scripture that God's way works. We just don't believe it enough to exercise practicing it the biblical way. It's either that or we just don't know what the Word of God says at all. And so we just do something else. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous because it puts us in a place of bloody hands. It gives us responsibility as being partakers for not helping a brother or sister. It's dangerous for that reason. It's dangerous because it would help us to enable somebody to continue down the wrong pathway. Now I will say all this with the caveat that thank God there's forgiveness. I'm, I am so incomplete when it comes to having handled everything the best way it could be handled in my life that I just have to constantly go to God and just ask forgiveness. Just say, God, I've just mishandled so many things. I just need to be forgiven, and God forgives me. And God gives more than one chance. You ever mess something up and God gave you a chance to fix it? It happens a lot. And especially with the messy business of people. People, you just mess up sometimes. And, and thankfully, sometimes God just gives you another opportunity to fix things. So this evening, I want to just look at uh, as, we, as we have looked at the matter of, of church discipline, I kind of want to look at the Christian perspective of church discipline. I want to remind you about something that I think everyone in here is pretty thoroughly aware of, and that is that First and Second Thessalonians, these letters to the church at Thessaloniki, these letters don't really contain any rebukes in them. They're not letters that are written to the church to say, you're lousy, and if you don't straighten up, troubles are coming. They are letters of reinforcement and letters of comfort 
But 1 Thessalonians largely is just a letter saying, you all are doing such a great job that you are an example and a blessing for believers everywhere. And we're just so thankful to God for you. I thank God uh, 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 upon every mention of you in my prayers. I just, you are just, the thought of you, when I think about you, my heart is filled, I'm encouraged, and you're a wonderful model church. That's really what 1 Thessalonians largely contains. It also deals with some matters that they didn't understand. The return of Christ to take His saints and the return of Christ to judge the world. And Paul really laid those out chronologically and helped us understand the second resurrection. So Paul dealt with that. That's not the message this evening. But that is doctrinal and intended to be helpful, but it doesn't contain any rebuke. It simply says, I don't want you to be alarmed. I don't want you to be frightened or afraid. It's really a letter. You know, there's a misconception here, and it would cause you to be afraid if you go down that pathway. And here are the facts that would give you comfort in Christ. But in chapter 4, Paul mentions something, and he jumps back into that vein of thought in chapter 5. And so we'll begin reading in verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his mother, his, his brother, in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man but God, who hath also given unto us His Holy Spirit. And as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Now let's stop here and just briefly summarize. Paul is saying to the church at Thessalonica, Thessaloniki, what you've been doing, we'd encourage you to do more. And we would encourage you to handle matters with the brethren the way that we showed you by our example. And the thing that you're notably, or that you're noted for, is generosity and love for the brethren. And we're not going to claim to have taught that to you. We understand that that is something that the Holy Spirit has wrought in you. Something God developed in you. You literally have been evidencing love and generosity for the brethren to the degree that nobody could take credit for having taught you that. God, God only could have done it. And that is a very, very warm, heartfelt encouragement that Paul is saying. He's saying, just do that. And he said, keep, he said, do it more. Do it more. But then he deals with something which is a problem. And he said in verse 11, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. And now all of a sudden he moves into a vein of self-reliance or individual self-responsibility. He said, you make it a study, you make it a matter to be quiet, and by be quiet he doesn't mean don't talk, but what he means is to do your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. In other words, not to make your situation everyone else's problem. I think it's a wonderful thing when brothers and sisters in Christ do what the church at Thessalonica did. 
which is help each other out. There are some individuals that in the church at Thessalonica had made it a habit of eating other people's bread and not dealing with their own business but kind of getting into other people's business and spending more time idle than working. You say, Pastor, working in the church? No, I mean working. Working to eat your own bread. Not making your sustenance or care the burden of somebody else in the church. And I don't know exactly what the situation is. I do see it uh, later on as well. But it seems that in Thessalonica there would be some people that noted how generous they were and kind of gravitated toward them because of the potlucks. Mm. <laughs> Now, I'm joking about potlucks, but I'm illustrating using them. They're the people that aren't, you know, I'm going to bring something awesome to the next potluck, and everybody's going to love it. They're the people that are like, man, I hope somebody brings something awesome to the next potluck, and I hope I love it. You know what I'm talking about? There was a Babylon Bee article a few years ago that talked about how a man had succeeded for a certain number of years at going to Baptist potlucks without bringing anything. He's the guy. <laughs> you know, what's it like if somebody happens into our church and we're having a fellowship meal? Please stay. There's plenty of food. Oh, don't, you know, you know what? And, and honestly, the right attitude is, you know, I didn't bring anything. I didn't, I, you know, I really, I should bring something. I should get, that's the right attitude. But you don't need to do that with generous people. Generous people understand that you bring something because they do the same thing themselves. So they can understand and say, well, just come eat. There's so much food here. We don't want to take it home. We want you to eat it. Come eat. And there are people like, man, you show up at them potlucks. Ho, oh, ho. Oh, they got so much food. And then the kind of people that say, you know something, there's plenty of other people bringing food. Why should I bring it? And what they actually are, are people who are using. They're not bringing, they're taking from the church. Now, does that ever happen on a one-off basis by accident? Yes, yes it does. Inadvertently. Have you ever been more blessed than you have blessed? Have you ever received more than you've given? Well, if you know God, you have. So we're not talking about that, are we? We're not talking about, i got to make sure, i got to keep a balance in a check sheet to make sure that I always contribute more than I take. You know, people that feel like that get fizzled out. They get burnt out. Mm. They do. They, they literally keep tally of everything they do for the Lord, and they feel so obligated to do at least as much as everyone else is and carry their own weight that they just put this massive burden on themselves which is entirely self-generated and not even expected of God. That's one extreme. But the other extreme is the willful, cavalier, careless willingness to just use people. And Paul said, I would... Um, he want, I want you to walk honestly toward them that are without, and uh, that ye may have lack of nothing. Now here's the symptom. Here's the symptom of people that do that. You know what the symptom is? The litmus test that shows you this is a person that does it? Poverty. Poverty is. You know the person that always takes and never gives, never has enough. just always true. You, can, you can't give them enough to give them to lift them out of their poverty. They'll always be poor. And it isn't because the poor are near to the heart of God. They are. God loves the poor. That isn't the reason these individuals are poor. The reason they're poor is because of an attitude. And Paul simply said, if you study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, he said, then 
you're going to be able to walk honestly toward them that are without, and you're not going to have lack of anything. Studying this portion of the Scripture ought to make something click in your mind or fall into place that causes you to think, I want to be a giver, not a receiver. What does the Bible say about that? Say it more loudly, Andrew, would you please? It is more blessed to give than to receive. Say it again with... Vigor? Yes. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. You ever given? Would you rather give or get? Give. Who here likes to get? Come on, put your hand up. Don't you like to fire? Who likes getting? I do. I'd like to get a C8 Corvette. <laughs> Like to get one. Um, right now, I have a list of Milwaukee fuel tools that I would like to get, and I will. I want to get their chainsaw. I want to get their uh, hacksaw. Eighteen volt, eighteen volt Milwaukee fuel. I want to get their. Don't write this down and get this for me. I, I some I'm gonna get. Okay, I like to get things. Um, and I get plenty. But I'd rather give somebody one of those. Yeah. I'd rather give I'd rather give somebody a Milwaukee Impact. You know those new Milwaukee Impacts? 1,400 foot-pounds of torque. You can break any bolt. Massive. I've never had a bolt that I can't break. <laughs> if it won't come off, I that won't break with that M18 impact. It's amazing. And I'm going to tell you something, I've given some of those away. Because I love them. And if I know somebody will love them like I do, I like to give them away. Would I rather give one or give one? I'm going to tell you something, I bought one for somebody else before I bought one for me. Because I'd rather give one than get one. Why? Because Why? It's more blessed to give than receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. It's, giving is just better. When I get something, I have to take care of it, and I have to put it somewhere, and I have to hope it won't get stolen. When I give something, you have to take care of it, you have to put it somewhere, and you have to hope it won't get stolen, and I can borrow it from you. It's more blessed. Now, that isn't the Bible doesn't say about borrowing <laughs> things that you give people. Okay, but that's just what I think. It does say things about the borrower being servant to the lender. Uh, but what if you give it to them and then borrow it from them? How about that? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't give it back. I just, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, you you keep it. You take care of it. I've done that. There, some of you know. Like I've got tools at your house. They're yours. If I ever need them, I'll come by and borrow it. You know, I'd a lot rather keep a tool at your house than mine. <laughs> All right, we we've gotten off. <laughs> but it's more blessed to give and receive and I hope something falls in place in your mind if you don't think this way that isn't always I need, I want, I hope I get to I'd like to give and I don't need anything have lack of nothing that's what, that's what Paul said he said that you may have lack of nothing now these are the individuals that Paul described to the church at Corinth as the example of the churches in the region of Macedonia and Achaia, these are the churches that by, the Bible says they gave out of their poverty. And they begged us that we would receive the gift. In other words, they gave out of the abundance of their poverty, the Bible says. And consequently, they don't lack anything. Now it's good to be poor and not need anything, isn't it? You're not really poor if you don't need anything. In other words, that's the solution. And they literally lived in a region that was poverty-stricken, and this church had gotten a testimony of actually being well taken care of. In other words, you know the people in that church, that, I don't know what it is about it, but those people just, they're not poor like everybody else. And it's not prosperity gospel it's not health and wealth and prosperity. It's not you, uh, you know, bag it and snag it and all that. 
It's not all those things. It is simply God blesses. And Paul said, don't let somebody come in the church and take away from that. Go to chapter 5. He mentioned also fornication and concupiscence, which is usually a sexual, specific, a specifically sexual lust. But go to chapter 5, where Paul kind of draws the net. And he said in verse... 12, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Those are all great things, aren't they? The people that God's put over you, esteem them, account of them very, very, give them a high estimation in your way of thinking for the Lord's sake, <coughs> and for their work's sake, I mean to say. Now, verse 14, Now we exhort you, brethren. Now, he didn't say beseech. Beseech is I beg, I earnestly plead. Now he said we exhort you. Now, what is an exhortation? <coughs> what? Grace. No. Encourage. What? Encourage. It's kind of an encouragement, but it's an, it's an authoritative encouragement. Uh, a person who has the gift of exhortation is a person that says, Y'all better! It has authority with it. Now it's an encouraging kind of thing. It's encouraging like a whip is to a horse or a goat is to an ox. You get what I'm saying? So you can use the word encouragement. You know, you don't always have to whip a horse, you just crack it. If he's ever been whipped, he knows what that crack means. You know, um, if you're a good dog owner, you have a shock collar for your dog. And you, you don't always, you just, a good dog, you probably only got to shock about one time. And it has this little thing that happens before you shock him. It goes, beep, and then, fizz, and tases them, you know, and just knocks them silly. And it'll hold them in their tracks. And it keep dogs from running in the street and getting killed, or uh, attacking a bear and getting killed, or anything, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll get their attention and stop whatever they're doing. The next time they're doing something and they hear, <laughs> what? They stop and wait for instructions. <laughs> you know, it just means whatever you're doing, quit it. And my brother had it. his dog ran out of his house one time. You, if you know my brother, you know his dog's pretty well behaved. Ran out of his house one time. I was running to the Kansas Power and Light guys full speed to greet them, but nobody really wants an 80 or 90 pound dog that you don't know running full tilt at you to greet you. You don't know. And he's got this <laughs> look on his face, and all of a sudden he hears beep, and he just rolls head over heels just blah, 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 you know and they're like man he was running for us it's like he tripped or something no he stomped exhortation an exhortation is an encouragement with authority or is something that's good but it has some teeth in it if you will now we exhort you brethren warn them that are unruly what is unruly? The word is a tactoy that uh, it, it's translated from. Unruly is out of, undisciplined, out of control. Not doing the things that you're supposed to do as a believer. Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. And I love that. You know, some people are just weak in the brain. And we should, be, we should try to comfort them. And that's a help for me. Especially with COVID going on. Support the weak. Support the weak. People that are not strong enough. You know, what's weak support? It's a cane. It's a crutch. Um, be patient toward all men. Be patient toward all men. I like the inclusion of everybody. Just, just have patience. Then it says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Now Christian, I have to say the Holy Spirit of God convicts me on this one just in an instant. And I just think of how often 
we casually talk about how we rewarded evil for evil. We just think, I mean, it's amazing to me how Christians just share their stories of they did this, so I did this. And it's not always direct, just all out revenge, but it's justification of not being Christian toward all men simply because of the way they behave. Well, if they talk to me like that, I'll answer them right back. Use that tone of voice with me. I'll use that tone of voice with you. See that ye render not evil for evil. And I think this is a pretty big deal that we ought to really tighten the leash on in ourselves. Watch it this week and just notice how often we excuse bad behavior just because of bad behavior. You yell at telemarketers? you hang up on them? I like telemarketers. Years ago I learned that they're fun. Uh, but... <laughs> Do you excuse, well, they're bothering me, they're taking time out of my day. Listen, it's never okay to not be Christian. We're not incrementally Christian. We're not Christian on the weekend. We're not Christian at home. We're believers all the time. And we're not supposed to render evil for evil. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. That's First Thessalonians. Go to Second Thessalonians. Chapter 3, <coughs> verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Now, while you look at those verses, let me jump back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Don't jump back there with me, but let me jump back to chapter 3 and let me read verse or chapter 4 and read verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Now, verse 6 of chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Remember this? You've received of us the tradition of how you ought to walk. We told you guys how you're supposed to walk. And walk is conduct. Walking is not, you know, this is the length of your stride and, you know, how much you elevate on each step and uh, maybe how you gimp if, you, if you're going to limp. No. It's, this is what your conduct should be toward all men. And now, Paul said in verse 6 of chapter 3 or in 2 Thessalonians, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. So Paul mentioned sexual sin, lust of concupiscence. He mentioned taking advantage or not working, studying to be quiet and eat your own bread and working with your own hands. Didn't he? When he was talking about conduct. If you'll study this, you'll see the language meshes. So here's the thing. Paul wrote a letter encouraging the church at Thessalonica and he mentioned in passing, watch out for people. I mean, don't be the kind of person, is what he said. He mentioned it in passing. He wrote the second letter to the church at Thessalonica because evidently he had heard that there was still some bad behavior going on in the church. Brethren taking advantage of each other. And now Paul said, you withdraw yourself from people who are behaving badly in the church. And that's church discipline. 
That is giving consequence to bad behavior. Does that make sense? I shouldn't ask if that makes sense. I hope it makes sense. The question is, is that what the Bible's saying? Yeah. It is, isn't it? That's exactly what Paul's talking about. And now he's saying, he's saying to everybody, he's saying, mind yourselves. Behave yourselves. I exhort you. Beep! Shock's coming. Straighten up. And it's sort of one of those things that everybody who's dealing with a problem hopes will be handled. Here's how I like to deal with a problem. I like to deal with it with everybody and not with an individual. Nobody's perfect and oftentimes we all have the same problem, right? So I'd like to just mention something in the church. Y'all know, does anybody here know what I think about people using the drinking fountain during the service? Mm -hmm. What does pastor think? Well, let me ask you a question. What do you think about people using the drinking fountain during the service? Brother, do you really think it's a distraction, Brother Lee? I do too. So, that's all we need. <laughs> we think it's a distraction for people to use the drinking fountain while there's preaching going on. It's bad behavior. Okay? Now, if Michael gets up, and he wouldn't do this, Michael gets up and goes to the drinking fountain during the service, and I go, Mike! Anybody ever heard me yell Mike like that? <laughs> His name just sounds good that way. I say hello to him. I, he'll be walking down Dixie Highway and I'll be like, Mike! Right, Mike? <laughs> I, mean, it's just, that's, that's, I come in on, on Sunday morning, I see Mike, I'm like, Mike! And I say, Mike, don't you get a drink during the service? Sit down, you're distracting people. And I don't like doing that. I'd rather just say, Hey, everybody, please don't use the drinking fountain unless it's an emergency during the service because it's distracting. But if I say that, and then what's his name? Mike. 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 <laughs> Gets up and goes to the drinking fountain, I'm going to have to say his name, and I'd rather not do that. Does that make sense? I want to do it that way. But it does have to be... Things have to be handled. That's just that's just the drink. That's just a unambiguous, to a degree, an opinion. I think that largely we'd all agree about the opinion, but that's not doctrine. The drinking fountain thing. I didn't find it anywhere in the Bible. I just think that we should be reverential in a church service and really make sure that the atmosphere is conducive to the Holy Spirit having free course, and that's a distraction from it. That's all that is. It's just an application of something that's more specific. All right, now, there's a difference between dealing with something corporately, and that's what Paul did in the first letter. He said, everybody, listen up. Don't be walking in the lust of concupiscence, and don't... Or be and do be very careful to study to be quiet and work with your own hands and eat your own bread so that you can have God's blessing. And then he said, I exhort you. And he got a little more specific about some things. Now, there were some people that still used the drinking fountain after all that. It wasn't Mike, he wouldn't do it. There were some people in the church that the word got back to Paul. People are still behaving badly. And Paul wrote the second letter. He said, now, I'm telling you, withdraw yourself from the unruly. Don't fellowship with them. We command you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ... Verse 6, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. And then he gets really specific about it and it actually seems trivial. Look at this, verse 7. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. 
For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you, neither do we eat any man's bread for naught or nothing, but wrought, that means worked or, or uh, crafted, wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. To follow us. So Paul simply says this, we weren't chargeable to you. We carried our own weight. We worked with our own hands. What Paul says, wrought, we know that sometimes he, he made tents. So he, he created, or he built, he worked. And the reason he worked was so that he would not be a detractor on the resources of the church at Thessalonica. I'm about to say something that I recognize is controversial, but it should be. It should be something that you don't get triggered about and you think about instead so that you can have discernment. There are a lot of missionaries that are disorderly. There are a lot of preachers that are disorderly. You say, Pastor, terrible thing to say. Let me tell you something. You don't know this, but I, I, get, I run into it all the time. This month this has happened. I get a phone call. Hey, Brother Price, I'll be down in your area. You know, because it's on the way to everywhere. You know. I'll be down in your area this next month. And I was just wondering if I'd be welcome to stop in your church or pastor of another church. Well, brother, that's... You know, we don't have closed services. It's public. Come on in. We'd love to have you. Okay. And they don't come. Sometimes they're more specific about what they're saying. Let me put it to you this way. Hey, Brother Price, I'm going to be down in your area next month. Oh, yeah, what you going to be doing? Uh, well, me and my brother and, and uh, my, my uh, cousin, we're, we're going to be uh, doing some deep sea fishing. Well, that's wonderful. I love to fish myself. I hope you have a wonderful trip. Well, we are, we are thinking about coming to the services on Sunday. Well, brother, I'd love to meet you. I'd love to fellowship with you. Come on. Uh, uh, you know, uh, would you be interested in having me preach for you? Well, thanks for offering, brother. I've got something on the schedule already. And they don't show up for the service. Now, here's why. They want me to pay for their fishing trip with your money. They want to preach, and I'll give them a hotel and an honorarium. I'm telling you, it's a business. And it happens all day. During It happens every week. There are preachers that spend their whole week preaching out, not in their church, doing their work. They go to all these conferences, and they preach. And I'll have a conference in my church, and I'll use my church's money to pay you. And you have a conference in your church, and you use your church's money to pay you. And we'll call it whatever ministry. And we're enjoying ourselves, and there could be some spiritual benefit by it. I'm not saying that. But you know what it really is? It's just using the church. Mm. If you want to go fishing, go fishing. Lord bless you. I'm for it. I fish myself when I want to. But I'm not going to have our church pay for me to go fishing or anybody else's church. That's disorderly. bad behavior actually I you may not like it but it, I'm, I'm not making it up there are missionaries that have been on deputation for 15 years been on deputation for 15 years they've been talking about what they're going to do and raising support and the whole time they've been supported by churches and they've been taking continuous support and they've never done one single thing they've said they're going to do for the Lord and I tell you why because they can't get an honest job they'd rather have one that they can just work two days a week than an honest job there are missionaries that have come off the field and never given up their support they haven't come off their support. And they just don't trust the Lord that they could work with their hands or do something to pay their own way. And so they redevelop or re 
purpose their ministry. Now I'm this kind of a support ministry. And what you raise support for, that's dishonest. Now, Pastor, don't you think there could be exceptions? I think that largely they're all exceptions to that. But if it's not an exception, don't you think that's disorderly conduct? Yeah. And it's rampant. And it's a problem. And you know whose fault it is? Theirs. Yeah, it's their fault. But it's also the fault of people who willingly participate in those shenanigans because they don't want to stand up to them or say something wrong or, or deal with an issue. And you know what happens as a consequence of that if you think about it? The consequence of it is you never hold their feet to the fire and they waste their lives. And they have no eternal reward in heaven. And actually, they're harmed by your unwillingness to say something and do something. Now, that's a missionary preacher perspective of it. Do you think there are people that just come in the church always needy? They just go around. I joked about this couple of weeks ago, I said they always call on Monday morning. I think I said that last Sunday. They call on Monday morning because if they called me Sunday morning, I'd say, come to the church and I'll talk to you after the service. I don't want to go to the service. They want a guarantee from me. What will you do if I come to the service? What will I get if I come to the service? Oh, is that why you come to church? You want something financial for coming to church? Am I obligated to give you a certain dollar amount, pay your utility bill, pay your rent for you to Fellowship with me? Attack toy. Unruly. So they call me on Monday. I'm going to move our service to Monday afternoon. <laughs> we got a service this afternoon. Why don't you come? <laughs> That's unruly, isn't it? And you know, there are people that have been in the system. They've gone and, and somebody shared the gospel with them and they've been born again. And they just go to churches to get stuff. And they're, if, if you're the church that's given the most stuff, they'll go there. I like food banks. But sometimes I just think food banks just open up the door for people just to come and freeload. They also bring you generous people. Generous people like food banks too. They like to give. But oftentimes they bring you freeloaders. So don't don't take and just run with everything I'm saying. I'm saying discernment. And here's here's the fix for it. Pastor, what do we do if there's disorderly people? We withdraw ourselves from those people. You know something? I figured out your modus operandi, and until I'm convinced that changes, it would be a disservice for us to allow you to continue this. We're going to withdraw. Can't do that anymore. And you know something? You know what they'll say? You're supposed to be... I get it all the time. You're supposed to be a pastor. Yeah, pastors are supposed to tell you when you're wrong. You know, when I talk like this, you, people get the impression I'm the most stingy, miserly, ungenerous person ever, but you don't know me if you think that. People that know me don't think that. That's right. I'm, I'm telling you that. I don't know how many people I've bought parts and fixed their car, and I've driven places, and I've given money to, and done things for. You don't know me if you think that. You're just judgmental and nasty. I'm serious, that, that really is true. I'm trying to tell you what the Bible says. And does it say it? Does the Bible say it? Right here. Right here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 8, Paul said, Neither do we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail day and night, night and day, that we might not be chargeable to you, not because we have not power. And then in verse 11, he said, or verse 10, For even when we were with you, we commanded, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. And then he goes on to say this, because I just feel like, well, then we can't have a food bank. Well, then we can't have a missions program. Well, then we can never have a guest preacher. 
You ever feel like that? Based on the things I said this evening, did anybody draw that conclusion? I had somebody who's a missionary. Well, oh, Brother Price doesn't believe in missions. That ain't true. That's the farthest thing from the truth that it could possibly be. Well, Brother Price, you know, never has pulpit supplier, never has a guest preacher preach. Listen, if somebody will come and will fill this pulpit and help us as a church, I want them to come. I'm not going to have them come because they need to finance a fishing trip. Okay, so Paul just simply said, And ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. In other words, what do you do if you have a food bank and, and disorderly people are taking advantage of it? Well, you just deal with the disorderly people and don't get tired of it. Be not weary in well-doing. In other words, a lot of times what we do is, well, I'm not going to support missions then if that's what missionaries are like. No, not all missionaries are like that. Let's right. use discernment. And let's enjoy the good ones. Well, you know what? I'm going to wonder every time a preacher comes to town now. Listen, if they come to this church, they're probably not coming to get their fishing trip financed just because of the pastor you have. Okay? So don't look at them that way. Enjoy them. And ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. I like to be generous. I like to buy people food. I like, to, I like to meet people's needs. I like to do things physically for people. Well, then go right on ahead and do that. Find, find good people to do that for and do it. In other words, we can't be so jaded that we don't do anything just because of people that abuse the system. Does that make sense? I hope it does. That's what the Bible teaches. God, thank you for what we've learned. Please help us to catch the spirit of it in the right way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.